Hi everybody, I'm really pleased to introduce Professor Tony Bono. The reason why I'm here at Bentley, because I still, I still remember when, that it was in 1999, I had applied, or 1980, I applied for a job here, and Tony, you called me to ask me about my work as a phone interview. And I figured you'd ask me questions about my dissertation and things like that, but Tony locked into my master's thesis, which no one cares about, anybody's <laughs> master's thesis, because my master's thesis was on the impact of computer automated machine production on the economy. And Tony, being a sociologist who's in the management department, which we'll talk about in a second, wanted to know about that thesis. Yeah. And I had forgotten everything about it. <laughs> so here I am being interviewed for this job, the only interview I had for a job, and here this guy is asking me about my master's thesis. So I don't know what I made up. It was an intriguing topic. That's all I can tell. Obviously, <laughs> whatever I made up on the spot worked. It apparently worked. So I landed the job, and, and here I've been since. And you know, one of the things that always intrigued me about this place, you know, besides it was the only place that offered me a job, so I made the decision pretty easy, was what does a sociologist do at a business? And this is what I call actually the, uh, the open house problem. When I'm sitting there at the sociology table and parents come up, and they say, what does sociology have to do with business? So how does a sociologist not only end up at a business school, but end up in a management department yeah. studying organizations and industries? Yeah. What's that all about? Well, you know, I, it, 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 it's really kind of funny. I, I was always fascinated with, with organizational life. And um, as an undergraduate, I just wandered into an industrial and organizational sociology class. And I think the dominant reason was the timing was right. You know, I didn't have to get up too early. It was, it, it, it just fit my schedule. And I was fascinated. I, I, I thought it was really very compelling. And at the time I, I, I did my, uh, my undergraduate, I was a business, business major. And it started giving me insights into what was going on in organizations, what was going on in the corporate world that I wasn't getting in the traditional business, business courses. And I was hooked. Um, and, and I really thought that if you begin to look at some of these larger forces that are really impacting people's behavior and why, why behavior begins to emerge as it does, you, you'll see that sociology has, has incredible re relevance to business. So, so I was really drawn into the whole field of organization behavior. And at the time, and now we're talking when I did my doctoral studies, mid to late 1970s, um, the field was really dominated by organizational psychologists. And so the focus just was on uh, perception, communication, uh, motivation, small group dynamics. Um, and I thought, well, this is, again, cr a critically important part of, of the behavior that occurs in organizations. It really wasn't looking at the impact that the broader social forces were having. Mm -hmm. And even go back to the Hawthorne studies where, where they began to uncover, there, there is this incredible social network uh, that exists you know, in, in organizations that has a far greater impact on people's behavior than they ever thought before. And so it really did begin uncovering uh, a whole new series of, uh, I guess, research questions and, um, and, and study that really, again, w was just dominated by, by psychological you know, thinking at the time. So it really did open up, I think, a tremendous amount. And if you look at organization theory, um, even though most of the, the theories don't directly uh, reference sociologists. It, 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 it's basically sociology, sociological theory. I actually, as a fellow major in psych and soc, as an undergraduate, I had one industrial organizational psychology class. I don't remember much from it. I remember one interaction I had with a professor where I said, so basically the idea is that management hires you to do studies for them to find uh, outcomes that support what it is they want to do. Yeah. And he went, yeah, they, yeah they, basically. <laughs> and so I, after that point, I was like, this IO psych stuff mm -hmm. is like, I'm not interested. Because I, so, I was really a sociology major. And I was this idea of being there for the worker, you know, to speak for the worker. And I always saw IO psychology as being more management, more top down. And so you came in to sociology through business yeah. and not like me through business, through sociology. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and again, I, I, I was just, I always fascinated by by, organiza by organizational life and, 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 and how and why managers act the way they do, you know, what role should business play in a larger society? Those are all, to me, very interesting questions. And, um, you know, I recall when uh, I was thinking about the next stage of my life, because I, I did spend some time in the military. I, I am part of the draft era mm -hmm. and, and, and the Vietnam era. Um, but when I got out of the military, um, I decided to go back to graduate school. And, and, and my, my initial thought, was I, I came to the Boston area, I went to Boston College, and I was gonna 
do a, a master's in sociology. But one, two things attracted me to, to BC was they did have a close relationship with the School of Management that I could take, take courses in both areas. But also Everett Hughes was there. Right. And he was one of the last links to Robert Park and mm -hmm. the Chicago School. Right. And I, I was fortunate enough to be one of Everett's last students. Uh, it was fast, and I, it was fascinating when when he could, when he really could, he could bring the Chicago School to life, and and so he was very big in kind of qualitative field work in the ethnographic tradition. Right. And and so I thought that's fascinating. So I, you know that was a huge gap in my sociological upbringing, which is not the only gap. There's many, but one of the major gaps was this idea of Everett Hughes, and so I remember friends of mine who were at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Jack Whalen, Eric Van Kuysen, you know, I borrowed a PowerPoint deck from them, and one of their slides was Everett Hughes and the study of work, mm -hmm. you know, and how he transformed the study of work, not just from these static descriptions of work and these narrative accounts of work, but the lived experience of work, the culture of being a professional, mm -hmm. identity, you know, being part of who you are in a job. And I always, you know, it's one of those things where I can't believe that in my theoretical classes as a sociologist, and I had many, never talked about Yeah, yeah. Well, every, yeah, his approach was almost like a journalist, right? Um, where he wanted to tell the, these rich, deep stories about what it was like to be in a particular profession. So I recall one of the things that really fascinated me early on on him was he talked about dirty work. Right. And he goes, you know, we tend to think of dirty work. There are some jobs that clearly are, 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 have, have a number of stigmas or taints, you know, from, from physical risk uh, to, to social you know, isolation and so But he said, but every job, even the best job you can imagine, has a dirty work component. And his fascination was how do people deal with that? How, how do they, right. you know, do they get through and how do they negate some of the, the stigma that, that's attached to that? And I just found it fascinating. Right. And I, he just really just, just drew me in, just captivated me. I know one of the, one of the things Everett used to say that, that really had influence on me is that, that if you clearly see something happening, uh, you can be pretty much assured that's going to happen again and again. <laughs> and um, I, I found that to be all too true right. um, to be happening. And so it really did alert me to really trying to look at some of these broader forces in terms of what was going on, why people behave the way they do. Um, so it, it, was, it was fascinating. It was, a, it was a great opportunity. It's amazing now that we have a TV show called Dirty Jobs. Yeah. Right? And we have all of these shows that have emerged and, you know, in the PowerPoint slides for the class, when I talk about this, that really do take this ethnographic approach to the lived experience of doing right. work. You know, from Deadliest Catch to, you know, Miami Inc. to Dirty Jobs to whatever is this kind of, this renewed love affair of the American public with manual labor mm -hmm. and work that has been stigmatized, which... Ever Hughes really yeah. using this Chicago ethnographic approach, this journalistic approach, trying to uncover the hidden experiences of work. Yeah. Well, and sure how that, that played out. So Henry Mintzberg, who was one of the current, I would I, I'd almost classify him as a management guru, did some phenomenal work early on. I, I actually think this was his doctoral dissertation to look at the nature of managerial work. And if you look at this, he argued that the basic way management is taught is totally wrong. And then there's nothing to do. It's, it's totally <laughs> right. It's, yeah, yeah, some things haven't changed all that much, but totally removed from the reality of what managers do. And so as you talk to managers and you say, like, they paused corp. So they plan, they organize, they coordinate, they control us. Right. He goes, no, what they do is they fulfill a series of roles mm. um, that where they process information, they have to make decisions, where they interact with people. And if you really understand what managers do, you have to go through this kind of this role analysis. And, and I think it, it really, it did begin to change the way in which a lot of organization behavior itself w was approached. Right. Unfortunately, you still do see a lot of the introduction to management courses that, that take that, that, that very kind of traditional textbook, um, you know, very sterile look at management, but it has nothing to do with what managers do. Right. So you talk to managers and they say, and, and they use, um, you know, a lot of very, you know, high level conceptual terms in terms of what they do. But when you actually observe them, they it, it's more action oriented um and 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 so he changed the way in which we really began to look at the role of the role of management the role of people in organizations right and you know we were talking earlier you know about this idea of you know the systems perspective or systems thinking and i was listening to a book recently 
where they were talking about what is systems thinking. It's this idea that things are interrelated and influence impact each other. It can be really hard to disentangle all of these things. And as a sociologist, we go, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> obviously. But then at the same time, I think part of one of the things that limits sociology's reach in these areas is the the fact that we can see the complexity, but can't necessarily then create a path through it. Right. And unfortunately, you had mentioned earlier, you know, your experience in IO psychology, and yeah, we want the studies to show what we want to do right. and prove ourselves, and they did that very well. Sociology doesn't neatly lend itself to that. We point to a lot of the complexities, a lot of the, um, I guess, ambiguities of organizational life, and try right. to understand some of that, but it may not necessarily lead to, so here's exactly what you need to do to deal with that. Right. Um, but it does sensitize you to things that are, are beyond your control. Um, I, I, I remember, and again, going back to, to Everett's uh, uh, a little premise that if you see something clearly, you know it's going to happen again and again. Uh, I recall some of the work, and again, early in my career, this is more serendipity than anything else, I stumbled into a longitudinal study of a merger. And at the time, the conventional wisdom was you know, all of the important um, kind of merger analyses were all pre-merger, pre-combination. And so if you really did all of that work, the deal was done. And again, early on, if you look through the 1970s, most of the mergers were called brick and mortar combinations where people really weren't all that important. But the change in that is that you saw all of a sudden mergers and acquisitions of human capital intensive organizations where people really were the essence of the organization. And I recall going through, and, 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 and I did this work with Jim Bowditch, who was my mentor and then long-term friend. Um, we were studying this merger, and one of the things that struck me was the duality of people's experiences. So we saw hope and despair, trust and betrayal, uh, what could be thought of these courageous acts of sacrifice juxtaposed with uh, cowardly acts of sabotage. And I remember talking to Jim at one point, and I said, wait, wait, what, what's going on here? When did we stop tracking what was positioned as this carefully calculated strategic act mm -hmm. and literally wander into a Shakespearean play. Mm. Um, and in the cover, I said, this is something that I, I really need to study because right. I just found it fascinating. And Everett was right. And, and when we saw this occur in one particular, uh, again, this longitudinal study, the six-year study we did of a, of a merger, and we found it repeated again and again and again in different contexts. Um, and... To this day, we still struggle with it. We have a sense of why this is happening, but it's still incredibly difficult. There's still these idiosyncratic, very unique aspects of all different combinations that really create tremendous challenges. And mm -hmm. so I, I just found, again, I just, just found that fascinating to study for, for a number of years. So how have you tried to translate it? Because you've worked with companies. How do you try to translate that into actionable objectives or goals? Well, one thing I try to do is to get managers to realize that, to understand something like you know, a major strategic, strategic move, like, like, like a merger, you can understand it at a cognitive level, but that's very different from experiencing it at a gut level and what people go through. And I try to get them to be very sensitive to, to these other forces that are, that are going on, so to really pay attention to what's happened, to listen deeply to what people are saying, because there's a tremendous amount of, of uncertainty and anxiety that that accompanies the, these combinations. Or on the surface, you'll see a lot of goodwill, um, a lot of good talk. It sounds very productive. You know, this is going to lead to a stronger, more competitive institution. Tremendous opportunities for people. Where just underlying that service, there's an, a surface. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety and frustration, and even fear. And when right. that begins to happen, it just uh, it, it just sends people the wrong way. Uh, and, and and so one of the things you try to do is is to get managers to realize that you know these are not simple deals that that the real challenge happens once the deal is signed how do you actually bring together and integrate two autonomous companies and get them to work together mm -hmm. again linked with the strategy that's envisioned for the company um and so we really talk about what is it going to take to actually make that happen mm -hmm. and unfortunately you know many managers you know are, are, are there five things they need to do and I'm saying, well, there are a lot more than that, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is going to translate into, you know, what, what, what your pre-combination feasibility studies suggest. But it's opening up to those possibilities, the things that you need to do to really begin preparing people to go through those processes. This is where I think sociology has so much to offer because I just had a conversation with an executive vice president of human resources at a big bank. Uh, and we were talking about these issues of employee experience and culture. 
And one of the points I was making with him, which he agreed with, luckily, was that people usually talk about culture as values, attitudes, and beliefs, the cognitive, mm -hmm. right? Just like in customer experience, people talk about perceptions that people have of the interactions that is had with a company's good service and products, whatever. People focus on the perception because you can survey it. You can, you can try to research it more easily than the interactions themselves. You know, so culture is not just the values, attitudes, and beliefs, they're the practices. Right. There's what people actually do, do yep. right? And so going back to Hughes, you can go in and see what people are doing. You know, you can, I, you can look, you can talk, you can shadow, you can observe, you can use all those ethnographic tools that the Chicago mm -hmm. School is famous for, then translate that with these attitudes into something that's more actionable yep. than just relying on the attitudes or the descriptions. You know, if you want to know what the workers think, don't talk to the managers, talk to the workers. Observe what they're doing. I was, I was saying that to this other person, I think it's true for a lot of companies, you know, change, you know, when change happens, if there's a lack of excitement, you can count on an, uh, the presence of anxiety. You know, people aren't, yay, change, they're gonna be like, oh my God, change. change yeah. You yeah. know, there's gonna be this duality of it. Yeah. And so I think ethnography and sociology well, has a lot to offer in that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things early on, so in, in the early 1980s, um, Terrence Deal and Alan Kennedy wrote a very influential book called Corporate Culture. And the subtitle, I think, was The, the Rights and Rituals of Corporate mm -hmm. Life. And on one level, they tried to be sociological and they said, okay, if you look at, 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 at industry forces, that really largely determined the nature of culture in an organization. So there are two critical factors, the, the degree of risk that companies go through when they make certain decisions, and then the speed of feedback that they have. And I said these two factors really began to influence the nature of the culture that would emerge. And I think there's some truth to that. But, and so if you're looking, for example, at two oil companies, they will tend to have cultures that are similar compared to, let's say, two banks. Right. But I always thought that that was overly stereotypical, right. that there was more to it. Right. And what we found, and again, you're talking about measurement, what people were doing is they were doing employee opinion surveys, not attitude surveys. Well, what they were really doing was capturing climate, not culture. So climate really deals with the satisfaction that people have with a given culture, but it says nothing about the nature of the culture itself. And so again, total serendipity, but this merger that we began to to study in a friendly merger between two area financial institutions. Uh, we had been working with one of the merger partners for a number of years and we had done a series of surveys and we, where we created action teams which really trying to, to improve customer service. And this is before advanced information technology radically transformed banking where right. people actually mattered. They had tellers, right. customer service right. representatives. So we worked with this bank for a couple of years and so we had all of this attitude data in terms of how people felt about, about the bank just so happens that the merger partner went through a similar intervention. We had nothing to do with that. Um, but they also had climate data based on their employee population. Both of these, these data sets were collected within six months of each other, had nothing to do way before the merger was even discussed. So we actually had baseline data on employee attitudes prior to the merger. And they were incredibly similar. And the two CEOs said, again, again, with the deal in Kennedy influence, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. We've, we, we've got right. similar cultures. What we found is that they had sim similar climate profiles but with, ex with literally polar extremes yeah. of cultures, totally opposite. And so the, pay, you know, the, the article that we wrote on this, um, that's actually viewed as one of the seminal articles in the very, when cultures collide. And it was just this major collision where no one could begin to understand why the other bank was doing things a certain way. But, so, but so you're absolutely right. And, and so, but it, so, so climate is not culture. And yeah. when you get into it, the nature of those cultures were extremely different. Yeah. I think that's where having this, again, as a sociologist, I was just at the Society for Applied Anthropology meetings. And we were talking, about, I was talking with organizational anthropologists. And we were trying to differentiate between anthropology and sociology. And besides the fact that anthropologists typically speak more than one language, because yeah. they're doing field works and sociologists probably speak one, we have a much broader methodological toolkit right. to draw from where we can say, okay, we can do the survey and yeah. combine with the culture data, like the ethnographic observational, um, you know, in, you're really focusing on this larger systems kind of orientation. It's not just attitudinal. 
right? It's, it's, it's systemic. And I bet you the people who worked in the companies knew that it was going to be a disaster, right? Because they were living it and they could be like, yeah, the, even though it's the same industry. Yeah, it, we're, 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 it, it just, it seems that we're different. Yeah. And, but the two CEOs never saw it. Right. You know, and, 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 it, and it became a fascinating change. So we went back in and we had opportunities to then, again, you know, interview people and, and, and we observed. Uh, what was going on at for meetings? We spent a lot of time in the organizations. We were able to go back with surveys, um, you know, mm. one year after the merger, and then two years after, and we found that all of those very positive feelings that employees had, you know, literally crashed. So going from you know, high, you know, uh, organizational commitment, organizational identification, and satisfaction in the high 90, 90 percentile range dropped into the low 40s, and and it took even. You know, two years, you know, three years after the merger, they still only improved to the mid 70s. Wow. And so it became again. It, but the, but I think this began to sensitize people to the fact that it's not that you have to kind of mesh two cultures, but try to understand why those cultures emerged as, as, as they did. Why do people behave the way they do? So I recall another merger. I, 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 I did some work. And again, this is this seems ancient history, but I did some work on the Hewlett Packard Apollo merger. And they had tremendously different cultures. And I recall we were doing one, uh, one series we call these intergroup mirroring exercises with, with groups from, from Apollo and from Hewlett Packard. And the employees themselves, you know, began to say, so how would you capture the merger? And they, they talked about it in terms of Hell's Angels meet the Stepford Wives. Mm -hmm. and, and we got, I was fascinated when he started talking about this. Well, you got into it. Uh, Hewlett Packard was a so-called Stepford Wives. I don't know if you recall that great you know, B, B, yeah, B, yeah. Uh, horror movie with Catherine, very young Catherine Ross. Um, but the whole thing was, you know, they were they were very polite, and 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 their culture was based on support. Don't rock the boat. Be a team player. Um, don't push. Don't question. Um, and so, you know, again, people at Apollo said they're Stepford Wives. They smile all the time. They say what what you expect great. them to hear. But Apollo, the culture was the only way that we can really break through, be successful, is to attack each other's ideas. Not each other, but attack our ideas that you have to question, you have to probe, you have to push. And to Hewlett Packard, this was like totally unacceptable behavior, right. that they were hell's angels. And it wasn't until we then began to get into some of the, this in-depth conversation about, well, why do you approach this way? We found that they were really trying to get to the same place just with two very different paths. And so one of the things we tried to get people at, at Hewlett Packard to understand is that when people at Apollo would push back and question you, they're questioning your ideas, not you. Right. And they're doing it to kind of try to improve the decisions that you're making. Um, that was still a very hard lesson for people at Hewlett Packard to hear. Right. But you know, those types of, of culture classes, just we, we saw you know, time and time again that it just it, it leads to very different beliefs about the way in which organizations should be run, the role that people should play, and how employees should deal with all stakeholders, from employees to customers to vendors, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. So, given that you're coming to the waning moments of your career, that's the very very end. Yes, that's the very end. Where do you see all of this kind of taking shape, whether in, because you're in a management department, also in sociology, yeah. but where do you see management needing to go? Where do you see sociology needing to go? And, you know, this broader area of a, whether employee experience or, you know, workplace culture, yeah. where do you see it moving going? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face right now, and, and I think where the field is going, is, is questioning the very role of business organizations, the role of management. Um, and so one of the things in terms of how my career has evolved is I've gotten very, uh, very involved with the UN Global Compact and then the management part of that's the principles for responsible management education. Mm -hmm. And so part of that, and I think sociology has been a, a leading force here, is questioning, well, what should the role of business be? Um, and, and, and clearly, profit making is important. You're not going to have a successful business unless it is profitable. But... Um, how far do you go to ensure that profitability? Right. And so we, 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 we've come a long way from Milton Friedman's classic, the social responsibility of business is increases its profits, right. to realize that the social responsibility of business really is to create value for a multitude of stakeholders. Now, clearly, investors, financiers are one critical group of stakeholders, mm -hmm. but it's not just that. And, and so I think it's questioning the type of wealth that business creates. 
And I think there's more and more conversation about that. Right. And so if, if you look at the, the, the next presidential election that will be fa you know, facing it in the not too distant future, that's already coming up as part of the, the Democratic platform is questioning right. the role that business should be playing. And, 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 what, you know, and there's, there's been tremendous criticism now of, of, of capitalism. Well, on the one hand, though, it has been one of the, the great forces in the world leading people out of poverty, but, but things just seem to be a bit out of kilter right now. I think it goes back to, as a sociologist, people talk about, you know, capitalism, and I always say, which one? Which one, yeah. <laughs> and which, which capitalism are we talking about? So as if it's a thing, right? And so we talk about, you know, the, the corporation, I want to say, well, which one? Are we talking about Patagonia? You know, you're very socially responsible, very much engaged in environmental justice and sustainability, very employee centric. Are we talking about, you know, an organization which is this, you know, idea of the, the, the primary responsibility of the CEO is to maximize shareholder value, right? And you talk about stakeholders and value. I think it's a really important point that employees are a stakeholder, you know, in that, you know, it's not just a transactional relationship of exchanging labor value for wage. It's how do we enrich, mm -hmm. you know, a person's self through their engagement with a company beyond just doing the work. And it becomes a lot of interesting questions about what's the role of the manager? Right. Uh, is the role, are you managing down to, to, to facilitate what the company wants? Are you managing, are you facilitating up to kind of bring forward the promise and the, the professional and then personal development of the employee? Yeah. Well, it reminds me, you know, one of, um, one of my French colleagues, Henri Saval, uh, who was at the University of Lyon, uh, always, you know, was very critical of the Western notion of human resources. It's right. A, it's one of, it's one of the, the strangest concepts he's ever heard. He goes, he goes, organizations don't have human resources. They might have financial resources, they might have operational resources. What they have is human potential. And people can choose to bring that potential to the workplace or not. And he said, so his thing is the role of management is to create the atmosphere, the culture, you know, the spirit that get people excited about their jobs, that they want to bring their full potential to the benefit of the organization. Right. But all too often, the way in which we currently manage organizations is we stifle that potential. Right. And people can figure out very easily what they need to do to just get along, get by. And he goes, and so we you know, our, our current thinking about organization limits the, you know, the potential that people could bring to the organization. And I think that's a very, to me, that's a very insightful way of thinking about the role of people in businesses. You know, can managers create the kind of atmosphere, the culture that makes people want to bring their full potential mm. and value to the organization? It's a really great point when people have asked you, what's, you know, what's, what's the biggest challenge in management or I say the word. Yeah. <laughs> management. Management. Because it's, is it, you know, how do you create value while you're managing, yeah. you know, people? And I think it's, and what was that, what was the person's name again? Yeah, Henri Saval. Yeah, so I think it's, you know, be something to, uh, to provide to the class because I think that that's yeah. a very important point that, you know, the, the way the word itself conceptualizes is it, it's conceptualizes it in a particular kind of way that limits the opportunity to evolve. Yeah. And progress. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the challenges to this traditional issue of management has become purpose. And again, this is Raj Sisodia's right. work on conscious capitalism, and, and, but, but a lot of other, you know, other frameworks fall into that. But what they're finding is that when organizations serve a higher purpose, something beyond profitability, one they find is that, especially if that, if that purpose resonates with key stakeholders, it becomes immensely profitable. But that's something that people can buy into, right. that they really can, can see themselves aligned with that purpose. And then that, then again, wants them to bring their full potential to the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that that's a very different challenge. That there's, there's too much, you know, we, we tend to think about, you know, management is control. And the only thing about, you know, the, 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 the essence of management is, is how, do you, how do you encourage commitment? Right. You know, much more than just control itself. Another last question. We talked about what management can do to bring value. What, what does sociology need to do as a discipline 
to bring its value because of one of the frustrating things we've talked about yeah. is a lot of what we're talking about in sociology is like yeah, yeah but then if it's so obvious in sociology why does no one ever why why does no one say you know what we need to do we need to find a sociologist yeah. so no one ever no <laughs> <laughs> well well unfortunately and again you know pogo you know we, we, we we've met the many and we, we've met the enemy he is us, us. I, I think within, and I know a lot of my colleagues, you know, think applied sociology is a dirty word. You know? right. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. Um, where I, I, I think, and again, uh, there can be pure sociological theory, and I think that does lead to a lot of insights. But I think we've missed, you know, many sociologists have missed the boat on the implied aspects of our, of our field. That's why I loved Everett so much. Right. Everett was, you know, not so much, don't give me theory, give me, give me rich description. What is going, and then make sense of what you see. Right. Right, can you explain it? Now here, the theory can enter into that, but you really want to focus on applying that insight into what do we know about organizations? How can we use that to make organizations better? You know, and you can only do that through the eyes of the people in those roles. And, but, but, I remember again going back to, to BC early on when I was talking about what, what is it like being a sociologist in the management department. I was almost seen as the enemy, like this the sellout. Why are you doing that? You know, it's not pure sociology. And I'm going, but you don't understand, sociology has such potential right. in opening people's eyes into other things that are going on, raising difficult questions. It's not going to necessarily give you the answers that you, this is how you resolve that, but it can really improve the decisions that you make. It can enhance. Um, you know the rich, the richness, the richness of your own thought in terms of trying to understand the forces that are around you, mm -hmm. and I think that's you know so so sociologists needs to be much more applied, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's where you see many in the, many people in the field just have have not gone in that direction. All right, I think we'll leave it off there. Thanks everybody. Thanks Tony. A pleasure. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thanks thanks for hiring me. That's yeah. Nineteen nineteen <laughs> what, years ago. What one of my better decisions? It was not a bad decision. I think I think it worked out okay. <laughs> It's been all right. It's been a good ride so far, and we, I appreciate the opportunity to work here and to chat with us today. Well, it's been a pleasure being your colleague all these <laughs> years. And as I, I said, I can't believe I've been here over 40 years now and, and, and getting ready to uh, fade off into something else. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure whatever it is will be as exciting as this conversation. Thanks, Gary. Thank My you. My pleasure.